We've been talking a lot about January 6th in the video from that day. We also want to talk about the January 6th trial of five Proud Boy members. It's now in its eighth week in Washington, D.C. Prosecutors overseeing the case are having some trouble and presenting to the jury the theory that the defendants used Trump supporters as quote-unquote tools for their conspiracy to breach the Capitol. Now, this week, the judge held a hearing to decide which videos he would allow the courtroom and jurors to see. These videos would be used to convince the jury, perhaps, that the Proud Boys committed sedition. That's what they were accused of. Lawyers for the defendants were attempting to stop the jury from viewing them, arguing that they would make a mockery of the traditional understanding of what a conspiracy actually is. And there are a lot of questions about these videos now because they've been selectively edited. On Tuesday, the prosecution also called an FBI agent to the stand who led the jury through some of the videos. And the government has several more witnesses to call, mostly Proud Boys, who have pleaded guilty already after cutting deals, which to some seems suspicious. But there's still a lot of uncertainty about what's going on with this trial. So there are about 44,000 hours. Uh, and we have, you may have read this today, been granted access to that and we believe that access is unfettered we believe we have secured the right to see whatever we want to see we think already that in some ways it does contradict that story and so we're going to spend the rest of this week taking a look at it Today is Friday, March 10th, 2023. Tucker's January 6th bombshell sends shockwaves through Washington, D.C. as spill of classified info derails January 6th trials. Democrats lash out against journalists exposing Twitter's collusion with the FBI at hearing. And Jim Jordan joins the show, baby. The big kahuna. We're going to ask him all about it. My name is Benny Johnson, and this is The Benny Show. Tucker Carlson released a goldmine of information and treasure troves of never-before-seen footage of how the federal government was directly involved in January 6th and hiding evidence and behaving illegally. Ladies and gentlemen... What about the word gold mine? The reason why you say gold mine is because gold has value. Gold has value against the government. Gold has value against a digital dollar. Gold has value against a collapsing economy. Have you seen the stock market lately? Oh, heavens, buckle up. Are you prepared? Let me suggest that you act soon and act now to protect what you have earned. I would like to introduce you to my friends at Allegiance Gold. With the highest rating in the industry and an A-plus from the Better Business Bureau, Allegiance Gold can help protect your IRA or 401k with physical gold and silver. You can also have gold delivered securely to your doorsteps. Gold is the only hedge against inflation, against a reckless government, against inflationary spending, trillions of dollars in debt, $32 trillion in debt. Doesn't matter if they took every single dollar out of your bank account and everyone's bank account, they would never be able to pay that back. What is going on here? Well, it's out of our control, but the thing that we can control is how we shelter and protect ourselves. And so that is why we buy gold. Right now, get up to $5,000 in free silver and a qualifying investment when you visit protectwithbenny.com. Protectwithbenny.com with my friends at Allegiance Gold. Ladies and gentlemen, it is confirmed. It is now officially confirmed. The federal government is lying to you. They are withholding evidence from January 6th defendants. It is real, it's ongoing, and it is happening. This is the story of the Proud Boys and their ongoing trial right now, which, because of Tucker Carlson's reporting, has led to panic in Washington, D.C. And that panic has steeped down into the very bowels of the FBI, and now the FBI is getting sloppy. This is Unbelievable, this story. I must tell you that I have never been more enraged reading a story from Politico or from any corporate media because normally you don't get honest stories like these. But big hats off to Politico for reporting on how the FBI has just proven they've taken out their firearm and they've shot themselves in their own foot, proven that they are destroying evidence have direct, confidential human informants inside the audience at January 6th, perhaps behaving criminally, and are trying to cover their steps in order to put innocent men in prison. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an absolutely and utterly shocking tale. Let's begin. Federal prosecutors inadvertently disclosed classified materials to the Proud Boys defense attorney. The Justice Department officials indicated on Thursday a snafu that has derailed 
at least for a full day, an important trial from J the January 6th attack on the Capitol. The admission in court, top DOJ official, came in connections with testimony from an FBI special agent, Nicole Miller. So Nicole Miller is the lead investigator for this Proud Boys case. Now, Nicole Miller was supposed to turn over her correspondence pursuant her investigation of the Proud Boys. This is normal. This is called the Brady Rule. You have to turn over to the prosecution or the defense your evidence so they can see it and they understand what's what's going to be uh, seen by the jurors and, and, and they can prepare for it. That's how the American justice system worked. It's a good system. Miller sent her list of email exchanges and text exchanges to the prosecutors in an Excel spreadsheet. But what she didn't know is that Miller, who thought she had filtered out all of the messages that were private, she ended up sending the entire tranche of messages to the prosecution, thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of messages to the prosecution, hidden rows inside of an Excel spreadsheet from the Department of Justice. The defense counsel stumbled upon them and then started grilling Miller about it in front of jurors in the case. Oh, it is so delicious. Oh, this is so sweet. So this deep state goon, man, again, <laughs> these people think that they're in charge. These people are supposed to be running the country? They can't even delete files inside of an Excel spreadsheet? What did these files show? And by the way, this led to utter panic in the courtroom. You're talking screaming by our federal government. The Justice Department attorneys told the defense team that they were concerned that there had been a spill of classified information. They call it classified because what it really is is proving a criminal conspiracy by the government. Let me tell you what's inside of these secret messages that the Department of Justice just inadvertently handed over. What were they trying to hide from you, ladies and gentlemen? Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Okay, here we go. So inside of these secret messages, U.S. Attorney Jacqueline Ballantine, who's supervising the case for the Justice Department, acknowledged that this spill of classified information, uh, she raised a particular concern about messages sent by Miller to other agents who were working in covert activity, she said one of the messages said they ordered her to destroy 338 items of evidence from a supervisor saying to destroy evidence in a January 6th trial. This could impact and classified equity of the case, Ballantine says. Defense lawyers cried foul noting that the government's claims of classified material arrived just as the defense sounded the alarm about the content of some of the inadvertently disclosed messages. While Miller testified Wednesday that she had produced about 25 rows of messages, the defense lawyer said there were thousands of rows of hidden messages relevant to the case. So they're lying. Miller said, oh, it's only 25 messages. Here you go. These whitewashed messages. And there are thousands of messages per that are Germane to this case, some of the messages appear to reveal that the FBI agents accused accessed contacts between defendant Zachary Real and his attorney, which led Miller to let colleagues in on the thought that Real would take the case to trial. In other messages, the FBI tells Miller, you need to go in to that CHS report. Just get an edit out that I present after defense attorney began to press Miller about the attorney client privileges in the afternoon. So let's not get bogged down inside of the minutia of this case. Let's just call this what it is. Destruction of evidence, hiding of evidence from the prosecution, spying on the prosecution, correction, the defense here in this case. So these are the defendants. This has all been revealed in court. This is a political article right here. Ladies and gentlemen, just yesterday, Julie Kelly was on this show talking about these absolute bombshell revelations that the government is not only involved in January 6th, they're actively hiding and destroying evidence. Watch. Another one, Benny, that I'm covering today is Judge Tim Kelly. He's one of the worst offenders, I think. Completely incompetent judge who is letting this DOJ do whatever it wants, including now uh, allowing an FBI agent who lied on the stand yesterday, concealed evidence in the Proud Boys trial, which included messages, Benny, where she, this FBI agent is talking with another agent about doctoring a report on uh, informants. And 
disclosing that her boss wanted her to delete, destroy about 300 plus items of evidence. When the, when the defense started to question this FBI agent and expose her lies, Judge Kelly abruptly ended her testimony, dismissed the jury so they couldn't see what this FBI agent was doing, held a special hearing today, again, outside of the eyes of the jury, um, and now is letting the government get away with saying that some of these messages that were hidden from defense that they found anyway, um, is classified information and therefore should not be entered into evidence yet. This is the kind of clown show that's going on. Ladies and gentlemen, they are panicking because this is starting to leak into the corporate press that the federal government is rigging trials against J6 defendants. Here's a local news clip covering the fact that the government just exposed itself as the real criminal conspiracy here. A delay in the trial against the Proud Boys accused of being involved in the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Federal prosecutors accidentally disclosed potentially classified material to defense attorneys. An FBI special agent testified that prosecutors shared unclassified evidence with defense lawyers, which is common. However, some classified information inadvertently was also sent in an Excel spreadsheet. The judge in the case pause the trial to determine how to handle that error. Proud Boys Chair Enrique Tario and four leaders of the group are accused of scheming to prevent the transfer of power from Donald Trump to Joe Biden. Yeah, that's how you stage an insurrection with a white claw in the front of your tactical vest. Got it. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's look at the facts here inside of the case. Let's look actually at the filings in the case. And we'll get down into the real meat and potatoes here. We're about to chop some wood. Julie Kelly's Twitter account has incredible context here, directly from the filings in the case. Drama in the Proud Boys trial yesterday. Here's what happened. The corrupt FBI went rogue. This allowed, this lie allowed the public to withhold information to operate without oversight from Congress. The agent or someone deleted thousands of messages in the FBI's messaging system, messages relevant to the investigation, required to produce for the defense counsel. You have to give them these messages. You have to. They tried to delete them. What messages did the FBI conceal from the defense? A request for the FBI informant to alter an official confidential human source report. Edit out that I was present. Look at it. Look right there. There's the message. Here, it is no longer a conspiracy. The federal government was involved in January 6th. To what extent? We are not sure. But now we know. The agent's request to edit out confidential human source in the report. I just put together, edit it out. Lie in the official FBI documentation. Will you ever be able to trust these people again? Again, Jim Jordan will be joining us very, very soon. I'm going to ask him directly about confidential human sources. Brazen lawlessness of the FBI at his biggest January 6th case. Boss instructs FBI agent to destroy hundreds of items of evidence. This is a slam dunk case of co seditious conspiracy. Why is the FBI destroying evidence? There it is. You can read it on your screen. Here's the messages. I have 338 items of evidence I have to destroy. There it is in black and white. Ladies and gentlemen, we love Tucker Carlson. But you don't have to look at Tucker Carlson. You don't have to watch Tucker Carlson. Show. Whatever you think of Tucker, and I'm sure you love him, but a lot of people are like, oh, it's right-wing media. Oh, my God. This is the black and white. Even more egregious, FBI accessed emails between the defendant and his attorney and discussed its contents. The agent did not know that this was going to trial. The judge ex accused the jury as soon as this information was revealed in court. We're going to zoom in one more time. Ladies and gentlemen, they spied on the prosecution. I'm sorry, correction. They spied on the defense and the defendants. Have you ever heard of attorney-client privilege? These are like foundational to our legal system. And the FBI is spying on them. The defendant communicates by email and phone with his counsel. They were listening to his phone conversations. I mean, what do you do to these people? I mean, how do you fix this? 
How do you fix this? Ladies and gentlemen, I mean, you, you have, you must rip up the FBI root and stem. This is a officially wholesale corrupted organization. Now, members of these, this Proud Boy group that was on trial are demanding a mistrial. Check this out. This document just published earlier today. One of the defendants, Dominic Pizzola, is demanding a mistrial. Demanding a mistrial requests an evidentiary hearing here, ladies and gentlemen, based on what? Based on what? The indictments, the indictments in the case with prejudice, meaning these leaks, because the FBI is destroying evidence and hiding their sources and Tucker Carlson's show. The revelations from Tucker Carlson's show. We told you at the beginning of this week, Tucker Carlson's show may lead to people being sprung from jail. And now, here you go. A motion to dismiss the entire case. A mistrial to be called and for the government to be told to hit the bricks. Because of, and there it is right there in black and white, Tucker Carlson's show. What did Tar Tucker Carlson's show reveal? Well, ladies and gentlemen, in the case of Jacob Chansley, it revealed that the government withheld evidence. Now, this is in violation of a rule called the Brady Rule, which is extremely important. We'll get to that in just a moment. But first, what evidence did they withhold? Well, the fact that Jacob Chansley, a.k.a. Chewbacca Man, was escorted to the Senate floor. Why? For a photo op? You have to ask the question, were these officers directed to take the guy that they wanted to make the face of January 6th? The guy with all of the flamboyant, uh, loquacious uh, trappings. They wanted to make that guy the face of January 6th. So they grabbed the guy that they thought would be the right ringleader. They took him and they told cops to bring him to the floor, prove that they didn't. Because I can show you footage showing that this man walked by a dozen armed officers and was escorted to the floor in the well of the Senate. They even jiggled the doorknobs. They were jiggling the doorknobs for him, trying to get him in. Was this all a setup for Jacob Chansley? Did they use him as a prop for their propaganda? He was selected? Watch dangerous conspiracy theorist dressed in outlandish costume who led the violent insurrection to overthrow American democracy. For these crimes, Chansley was sentenced to nearly four years in prison, far more time than many violent criminals now receive. What did Jacob Chansley do to receive this punishment? To this day, there is dispute over how Chansley got into the Capitol building. But according to our review of the internal surveillance video, it is very clear what happened once he got inside. Virtually every moment of his time inside the Capitol was caught on tape. The tapes show that Capitol Police never stopped Jacob Chansley. They helped him. They acted as his tour guides. Here's video of Chansley in the Senate chamber. Capitol Police officers take him to multiple entrances and even try to open locked doors for him. We counted at least nine officers who were within touching distance of unarmed Jacob Chansley. Not one of them even tried to slow him down. Chansley understood that Capitol Police were his allies. Video shows him giving thanks for them in a prayer on the floor of the Senate. Watch. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for giving the inspiration needed to these police officers to allow us in this building. Contrast the reality of what Jacob Chansley did in the Capitol building on January 6th. The I'm going to say this definitively on this show. If you punch a cop or you hit a cop or you behave violently towards a cop, you should go to jail. I don't care if you're wearing a red hat or a BLM outfit or an Antifa mask. But I will also say this definitively. If a police officer helps you commit a criminal act, then that person is accessory to that criminal act. If that police officer is escorting you to a robbery, well, then that police officer is an accessory. That's just how our legal system works. They assisted in the crime. So where's the charges for these officers? What's going on? I, mean, look, I can't believe I'm asking this, but like, what the hell's going on here? It, either these officers were in on it 
and they wanted the insurrection? Or these officers were told to make Jacob Chansley the number one photo op of the insurrection. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. And these officers purposefully guided that man directly into four years in prison, 800 days in solitary confinement. Not only that, the federal government withheld this information from Jacob Chansley's attorney. Jacob Chansley's original garbage attorney made him sign a plea agreement and he never went to trial. So Jacob Chansley's attorney never even pushed for this information. Jacob Chansley's uh, grease bag slip and fall attorney was on Tucker Carlson's show. We won't play you that segment because this guy's scum. He completely snow jobbed Jacob Chansley. He said that he had never seen that footage. Now, our in-house legal expert, Mike Davis, said that that's a violation of the Brady rule and that Jacob Chansley may well be sprung from jail because of this. This is foundational to American legal justice system. Watch. There is a Supreme Court case called Brady versus Maryland from 1963 that says that prosecutors must make available to defense counsel, defendants and defense counsel, exculpatory evidence, evidence that, that would tend to show that they're innocent of the crime uh, uh, with which they're charged. And you can't just say, look, there are 44,000. We don't even know if Jacob Chansley's first lawyer even had access to these videos back in September of 2001 when, he, uh, when Jacob pled guilty to these bogus crimes and got sentenced to 51 months in prison. Uh, but even if he, even if the Justice Department said, sure, uh, defense counsel, you can go to the Capitol. Remember, it's 44,000 hours of tapes. And Judge Royce Lamberth should order a sh uh, issue a show cause order asking why he should not find Brady violations here and sanction these attorneys and throw out Jacob Chansley's conviction. Now, these attorneys need to be disbarred. Now, Jacob Chansley's current lawyer, who is good, I've requested a little bit of information on this guy. This man seems to be in good standing. He seems to be doing the right thing for his client. He was on Tucker Carlson last night talking about this exculpatory evidence that the federal government withheld from Jacob Chansley. So just to summarize here, now we have at least a half a dozen J6 defendants that the federal government is openly attempting to hide or withhold evidence from at least a half a dozen, including this Proud Boys trial, plus the Jacob Chansley trial, where the federal government refuses to behave in accordance with the law in order to get a political narrative set. Here's Jacob Chansley's new lawyer who may be able to deliver the impossible. We'll see. Watch. So, but now that we know that this was a, a, a travesty, I mean, the people responsible for it should be punished. Liz Cheney should lose her job today as a professor at the University of Virginia. She knew this. She destroyed a man's life. But how do you get Jacob Chansley out of jail now? Well, we're looking at that. I'm not sure there's an easy solution. There's not an easy road to that um, to get the matter back in before Judge Lamberth and the, the district court here and to have him reconsider his sentence. Uh, in many ways, it's procedurally barred. We're going to have to come up with a creative way to get it back before Judge Lamberth. Frankly, I think Judge Lamberth may be a little bit um, unhappy that uh, you know the government presented some videos at the sentencing to paint Jacob in the worst possible light, the way they described him uh, in court as, you know, the face of the insurrection, uh, violent. Um, and then, you know, Judge Lamberth, frankly, he gave him the sentence that Albert Watkins negotiated. The sentence in the plea agreement was 41 to 51 months, and Judge Lamberth gave him 41 months. Um, but I don't think Judge Lamberth today probably thinks he saw everything he needed to see when he made that decision. So that is the new attorney for Jacob Chansley who's saying that the judge is pissed. Now, the judge is upset because the federal government withheld this evidence. Again, you cannot have evidence of a police officer in uniform, badges, guns, and everything, sitting there watching this man allegedly commit a crime, ushering him to that crime, engaging in opening the doors for him. It, it's Occam's razor. You only have one option. There's only one real solution here, and that's to bring those officers in and ask them, did somebody give you an order to escort this man into the Senate? 
Well, I mean, why else would you do that exactly? Please explain to us why you would escort this man around unless you were ordered to make a pariah out of a specific individual who was flamboyant so that they could cast a narrative. The real truth about this and what those officers were going through, and we feel for them, honestly, because this was a day of chaos and nobody seemed to be in charge here. The person who was supposed to be in charge, Stephen Sund, was on TV two nights ago throwing Nancy Pelosi directly under the 18-wheeler that is January 6th, saying that, Janu that Nancy Pelosi is the only person who was actually in charge of security that day, and he had to wait nearly 80 minutes, just enough time, for rioters to breach the Capitol building for Nancy Pelosi to request any assistance. He was screaming on the phone, my guys are getting killed out here, help me, let's secure the building, which I'm sure we all agree is what should happen. I am in favor, I was in favor of Donald Trump's plan to put the National Guard there. Just eliminate any chance of brouhaha. Put, strap up your boys and put them outside. Trust me, no one's going to step to those guys. I was totally in favor of that and you should be too. Nobody should want this to happen. Nancy Pelosi is the only person responsible here. What did she do when hooligans started fighting with cops, behaving badly, breach teams, run, may or maybe run by undercover federal agents, started breaching the Capitol? Nancy Pelosi went silent for nearly 80 minutes. My source? Well, the head of Capitol Police. Go. Speaker of the House in charge of security at the Capitol. So you have the politically appointed Capitol Police Board that's put uh, in place by, you have uh, the Sergeant Arms that's put in place by Pelosi, you have the uh, Senate Sergeant Arms that's put in place by the uh, Senate leadership, and then you have the architect of the Capitol that's put in place by the, uh, the president. So you have three voting members. I'm a non-voting member. I'm the only non-politically appointed non-voting member, uh, and that's kind of how the security oversight works. Uh, but it was Paul Irving who immediately said, I'm going to run it up the chain. I'll never forget that. Running up the chain. His chain of command ends at Speaker Pelosi. And I had to wait 71 minutes to finally get an approval at 2 at uh, 209 p.m. before I could finally reach out and start calling in federal assistance. 71 minutes when my men and women fought on the uh, brutally, I mean, fought heroically to prevent the uh, Capitol from being defended. I mean, from being penetrated. And it took 80 minutes before the first window was broken. So those were critical, essential minutes that we we're losing. Did you catch that? Just enough time for the Capitol to get breached. 71 minutes, and at minute 80, the Capitol was breached. So this, of course, could have been repelled and turned back immediately if they had just called in the force. Or, better yet, Cash Patel tells us he has, liter he has the documentation to show you that Donald Trump wanted to deploy 20,000 National Guard troops. And Nancy Pelosi said, no. No. Nancy Pelosi, martini in hand, swaying back and forth. Paul Pelosi stuck in San Francisco doing Lord knows what. Drunk driving, presumably. Nancy Pelosi not protecting the Capitol. I'll, let, I'll leave you to fill in the gaps as to why. Did they want this to happen? At some point, you're left only with that explanation. Did they want this to happen? As Tim Poole wisely says, listen, if you wanted Donald Trump to win in 2020, you should have just let Antifa overrun the White House. Tim Poole makes this point. It's a great point. When, the, when Antifa and BLM attack the White House, I know this is going to like shock you, and it, 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 in my gut, I'm saying no. But actually, politically, it'd be really wise. Donald Trump should have just called all the forces off, let Antifa come through, and desecrate the White House. Let it be captured on HD, broadcast, and then Donald Trump comes out of his bunker the next day, walks through the ashes, looks Joe Biden directly in the face, and says, you did this. Looks Kamala Harris in the face, holds up her tweet, her BLM tweets, and her funds to spring these people from jail, and says, you fundraised to burn down the White House. You did it. And then you take all of that footage and you just browbeat and pistol whip the Democrat Party all the way through the election with it. And the American people would be so, so repulsed by it that they, of course, would side with Donald Trump. He'd win in like a 40-state landslide. Blue states would go for Donald Trump if they had just 
lowered the barricades and let Antifa take the White House. That's a, that's what Tim Pool says. And you know what? He's completely correct on that. Now, we're not like deeply immoral people that are so craven for power. We would just desecrate our national monuments. But I think the left is, actually. And Donald Trump is calling them out on Truth Social for this. Donald Trump on Truth Social saying, the, we got to release all the prisoners now. Release the January 6th prisoners. They were convicted or awaiting trial based on a giant lie, the radical left con job. Thank you to Tucker Carlson and Speaker of the House Kevin McCarthy for what you both have done. Video footage is irrefutable. Now, Donald Trump is thanking Kevin McCarthy. Donald Trump has been a big Kevin McCarthy backer. Maybe this is why. Kevin McCarthy making huge moves here, ladies and gentlemen. Kevin McCarthy made massive news yesterday saying that these tapes will be made fully accessible to the public. Whoa. Check this out. Watch. Do you intend to release these tapes publicly after you go through and remove anything? Yeah, we just yeah. want to make sure we go through them all. <clears throat> and it takes time. <laughs> and you know, with Tucker, he just saw a few. It didn't like we released all the tapes to him. Right. And um, the first thing that Tucker said, too, he didn't want to show any exits to cause any problems. Um, we asked the Capitol Police, were there any concerns? They came back with one, and we mediated that. But it was interesting, that one that they had a problem with, Eric Swalwell had had up on uh, the... Okay, so this is huge. We are also going to ask Jim Jordan about that. Does he agree with releasing the January 6th tapes to the public? I've said this for a while. Um, there's only so much one person can do and one producing team can do. We're proud of the team that we have here. And we thank you for supporting us just by watching our show. You support us. And you, should, you support the members of our team that do uh, this research every single day. But if we were handed 45,000 hours of footage, uh, it would take us years to go through that footage. There's only so much uh, one individual can do. If you crowdsource it and put it out to the internet, man, I know, I know the autistic people on the internet. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, there would be such a treasure trove of new facts and data and evidence that is found. Nothing is greater than the internet sleuths, often anons, that exist. And man, they would pour over this sucker and they would rip it to pieces. Also, planning on ripping this to pieces, House GOP launches probe into January 6th panel. Larry, Barry Loudermilk, chairman of the House Administration Subcommittee Oversight. Oh, that's delicious. Barry Loudermilk. Oh, that's fantastic. He's going to be in charge? Isn't he the one that they said helped a, held a reconnaissance mission? That's great. Fantastic. Barry Loudermilk, chairman of the House Administration Subcommittee on Oversight, is leading the investigation. The probe will begin stages, Loudermilk says, on Wednesday. We've got to get through the documents. We've got to see interviews with people. At some point, we have to have hearings, Loudermilk said. He is adding a panel for reviewing January 6th. The House Administration Committee set up a capital security info portal on its website for tips from individuals with knowledge of the events of January 6th. Way to go. Way to create now the counter narrative. And it's not a narrative at all because this is suddenly a fact-based narrative. This this. This situation was complicated. It is currently ongoing. And a small group of elites seething in Washington, D.C. needed this narrative to be set in order to maintain power over you. Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene tweeting, uh, Tonight, James Comer and I sent a letter on behalf of the Oversight Committee to Mariel Bowser demanding the accountability in the D.C. jail for the treatment of pre-trial detainees. GOP oversight is investigating treatment of pre-trial detainees. Man, this is what a muscular, this is what a absolutely fearless Republican majority is set to do. And speaking of fearless Republican majority, ladies and gentlemen, Jim Jordan held a Twitter files hearing yesterday. Jim Jordan will be joining us here in just one moment. Jim Jordan held a Twitter files hearing yesterday and went on a absolute terror against these seething, vicious Democrat propagandists who attacked journalism at its very core, at its very essence, demanding Matt Taibbi and Michael Schellenberger give up their sources, talk about private communications that they had on their journalists. I mean, they've like, desecrated the First Amendment, proving that the censorship industrial complex is real. And Jim Jordan's the man who's holding these hearings in weaponization. He had an absolute barn burner 
to begin the trials, essentially, of the Twitter censorship regime yesterday. Watch. In September of 2020, a government-funded think tank gets involved. They do a tabletop exercise. The participants include the New York Times, the Washington Post, and other mainstream media outlets. Facebook is there. Mr. Roth of Twitter is there. The organizer was the former CEO of NPR and the former head of news at Twitter. The mock exercise is hosted by the Aspen Institute. The Aspen Institute, which, by the way, in 2020, their budget was $9.3 million, $5 million from the State Department, $4 million from USAID, almost all their budget. Guess the title. Guess the title of this exercise, the Aspen Digital Hack and Dump Working Group. And guess who the subject was? Guess who the subject was? Hunter Biden. That's amazing. It is amazing, but none of this is beyond belief. What was actually beyond the belief for someone like me who has done this my entire life, broadcast, journalism, writing, this is what I've spent my entire career on, is to see Democrats behave in such a repulsive way towards journalists and truth seekers. Here's one Democrat, Rep. Rep. Sylvia Garcia, asking journalists if they were in a threesome with Elon Musk. <laughs> not, sure, not sure you're allowed to ask that. Uh, but here we go. In um, in your discussion, in your answer, you also said that you were invited by a friend, Barry Weiss. My friend Barry Weiss. So this friend works for Twitter, or what is what is her? Um... She's a journalist. Sir, I didn't ask you a question. I'm I'm now asking Mr. Schellenberger a question. Please yes, ma'am. Barry interrupt. Weiss is a journalist. I'm sorry, sir. She's a journalist. She's a journalist. So you work in concert with her? Um, yeah. Do you know when she first? Um, was contacted by Mr. Musk. I, I don't know. You don't know. So you're in this as a threesome? Um, there was many more people involved than that. There was many more people involved with it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, seconds to Jim Jordan joining our show live, but we got to play you the triggered moment of the entire hearing. We're going to ask Jim Jordan all about this in just a few seconds. But the triggered moment of the entire hearing was this fake congresswoman, Stacey Plaskett, the so-called congresswoman from the Virgin Islands. She's just a delegate to Congress. She's a non-voting member. She's a CIA asset who's in the Virgin Islands to look over investments there. She also took a ton of money from Jeffrey Epstein just to show you the moral character of this wench. And she went on a absolute... Uh, which is brew against these journalists and against Jim Jordan for daring to even hold this hearing. Because how dare you question the narrative? <laughs> this, is, this is Stalin's Russia, right? Watch. Mr. Chairman, I'm not exaggerating when, when I say that you have called before you two witnesses who pose a direct threat to people who oppose them. It's funny. When people have to go through that, Crazy exactly. This is unacceptable. I'm ready for it. I don't know if a lot of other people are, but just as it was unacceptable for Kevin McCarthy to provide 41,000 hours of sensitive security footage to a biased talking head in an effort to rewrite what happened on January 6. This is a new Republican playbook, apparently. Mr. Risk Chairman. American safety and security hang on, hang on. to score political points. The gentlelady's we, word should be struck. We do not accuse witnesses of threatening others. That is out of line and I'm outside the rules of this down committee. That, and I can have an you don't get to determine what what's witnesses. struck down. Well, you, do, you, you do get an opening statement, and, it, it's, and about, so let it's about me finish. over. The, the committee will suspend. Wow. We know this is because at the first hearing, the chairman claimed that big government and big tech colluded to shape and mold the narrative and suppress information and censor Americans. This is a false narrative. We're engaging in false narratives here, and we are going to tell the truth. Okay, so hilariously, that person said that Matt Taibbi and Michael Schellenberger are so-called journalists. She called them that, and they were, like, laughing about it. Uh, and in her own Wikipedia, it says that she's a so-called delegate. <laughs> Wait. We pulled this up yesterday. Hilarious trolling. It upset Miss Plaskett so much that she actually called Wikipedia and had it changed. So we were actually, she actually screamed at Wikipedia enough to change it. They scrubbed that overnight. So this is how embarrassing and venomous and vicious these people are. They're dirty, 
dirty people, and they're getting triggered by the great Jim Jordan. Jim Jordan, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee and the chair of the Select Subcommittee on Government Weaponization, joins us now. Ladies and gentlemen, joining us now, a man who needs no introduction, Jim Jordan. And sir, thank you so much for being on the program. Also, yeah. good luck to the Ohio State Buckeyes for the NCAA Wrestling Championships. In thank one you. Week. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, they're going to need it. They're, uh, it's going to be tough to beat Penn State or Iowa this year, but uh, hopefully they'll do well. Well, you know, I'm a Hawkeye and a lot of love from the Midwest, a lot of love to the state of Ohio. We spent a lot of time there in East Palestine, actually, yeah. uh, oh, this year. You. And so... So yeah. certainly lots of love. By, by the way, Benny, I was just I was just out in Iowa City. I was doing an event for a colleague. And so I said, if I'm going to go to Iowa in February, I'm taking a match. So I watched the Iowa Oklahoma State dual meet on. Oh, that Sunday was a good one. Night. Yeah, it was good. And it, like Oklahoma, I mean, Iowa put it on it, but there were some tight matches. So it was, uh, yeah. it was a lot of fun. And it was typical Iowa wrestling. Fifteen thousand sold out Carver Hawkeye Arena. And so it was a lot of fun. And they, they had some bunch of alumni back who were, you know, my generation, that old generation of wrestlers. So. It was good to see some of those folks too. Did you get a lot of love from the Hawkeye State? Yeah, it's good. I mean, Gable and 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 his wife Kathy, they're 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 Republicans. They're 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 good folks. So uh, we've we've had a friendship with them here. But particularly when Gable got the Medal of Freedom and Pre President Trump pre uh, presented it to him, we were there at the White House with him and his family. So it was uh, it was kind of fun to see them. And then John Smith, of course, the legendary coach, Oklahoma State. So we had a good time. Had a good time. Speaking of sold out crowds and packing them in, Tucker Carlson was packing them in for his January 6th expose this week. I think a lingering question that we would have about this investigation is the government lawyers, the lawyers for the DOJ and the federal government and the DC prosecutors withholding evidence. Do you believe that those lawyers should be disbarred if they actually withheld evidence and violated well, the Brady rule? Yeah, if you didn't, if you didn't give over, you know, turn over evidence, I mean, you can't, you can't do that. So uh, certainly that is a, that is a problem. And I'll tell you what else we've learned from whistleblowers, FBI agents who've come talk to our committee staff, and three of them have been willing to sit for a transcribed interview. Uh, just the pressure, the intense pressure to go after anyone associated with January 6th. We had this one whistleblower testify, Benny, where he said there was a, there was a busload of people who came down from, from the Boston area. He worked in the Boston field office, this FBI agent. And he said they sent him a, a, a picture and video of, of the two people who organized these two busloads of folks who came down. And I guess they were inside the Capitol. And so they said, we want you to open up an investigation on these two people. And they said, OK, they're inside the Capitol. We're going to we'll, we'll begin an investigation. Then they said the other 138, we want you to open up an investigation on them, too. And, and, and our whistleblower said, why? Do you have any evidence that they were inside the Capitol? They did something wrong. He said, no, 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 we just want you to, we just want you to do it. He says, no, we're not going to do that. But he said that, that, that was just one of the many examples of how intense the government went after uh, folks who were in and around the Capitol uh, on that particular day. Yes, you've had colleagues ask about this, and we would be interested to see if you have any whistleblower evidence of confidential human informants for the FBI in the crowd or in the Capitol on the date of January 6th. Yeah, we, well... It sure seems like that's probably what happened, you know, based on the way uh, FBI Director Ray has has uh, responded or frankly not responded to that question. He's been asked now a couple times by some of my colleagues in committee hearings. Uh, we haven't had Mr. Ray in front of uh, the Judiciary Committee in a while. Uh, I'm sure that's going to happen at some point. So um, it's been interesting how he's answered that question. It sure seems like that was that that was going on. And, and based on, again, some of the things we have seen uh, from what uh, Tucker's been playing as well. I think that's a question we'll find out here at, at some point. Yeah, I know this would be unprecedented, but in Tucker's second night of bombshell revelations, he talked to Capitol security officers, police officers. The police chief, Stephen Sund, has come out and saying Pelosi was the one yeah. who made the Capitol so breachable and so vulnerable that day, put obviously people's lives in danger and people lost their lives, like Ashley Babbitt, unarmed female veteran MAGA supporter uh, who was killed and murdered without warning. And so I suppose my question would be, what could you do to ask Nancy Pelosi questions about that day? I know it'd be rather unprecedented to bring a member yeah. of Congress in to ask questions, but it seems as though her responsibility was the security of the Capitol and she failed yeah. horrendously. And I, I think, and, and uh, Mr. Sun pointed this out, uh, but I, I thought this from the get-go, because if you remember, Mr. Banks and I, my, my colleague and I, we, we were uh, named uh, to be on the committee by, by, by then leader, but now Speaker McCarthy. 
And there was an initial story in, in one of the publications here on the Hill that said, oh, the Democrats are fine with the, the people that, that Leader McCarthy had uh, selected for, the, for that committee. And then Mr. Banks and I start talking about how we felt that we, we'd, we'd seen that, that communication where Mr. Sun had talked about the optics of not having the uh, National Guard and the presence here and the fact that we, weren't, we didn't have the, the proper security posture that day for a rally of this size. And as we start talking about it, then and only then did the, the, the Speaker Pelosi say, oh, you're, you guys aren't going to be allowed to be on the committee. Because I think it all boiled down to that simple fact. In the summer of 2020, we saw what happened around the country. We saw the Democrats' response. They were for defunding the police. They called it peaceful protests when it was rioters and looters. And so then to turn around and have the kind of presence you need for a rally this size, they didn't like the optics of that. And that was clear. Mr. Sun pointed that out. And I think that's why. Um, there was the there was the lack of of National Guard and others here uh, that day. Yeah, I mean, it does seem as though the person to be questioned here would be Nancy Pelosi. Also, perhaps the police officers who escorted Jacob Chansley around the Capitol. This is coming off as some of the most alarming footage that this man had Chewbacca man, as he's belovedly known, uh, yeah. serving three years in prison being escorted around by Capitol Police officers. Do you have any idea what's happening in this footage and why this would be occurring? Seems like I, don't, setup. I don't know. And I, I think it's good that Tucker has this and we're, we're seeing the, the full picture. I mean, transparency is good. It's, it's supposed to be a government of the people, by the people, for the people. So be transparent with we the people on all issues. It seems like we, you know, where there always seems like something they're telling us that isn't accurate uh, on, on COVID, on everything else. So just be transparent with we the people. So we, we're, we're Americans, we can handle the truth. And in these, these pictures, it does seem like, you know, they're just walking around and, and so many of the people at the end of the Capitol were doing that. Um, now, I don't know if this was to deescalate as, as some I think have claimed, maybe, but um, again, the, the pictures are, are pretty telling. People who did something wrong that day, of course, hold them accountable. But there seem to be so many folks who are getting contacted by the FBI, some in cases that they never even came in the Capitol itself, but still being contacted by the FBI and checked out. Um, I think a lot of Americans find that pretty concerning. Yeah. Are you in favor of all this footage being released to the public, as Speaker yeah. McCarthy noted? Heck yeah. I totally, I totally support the Speaker. Uh, like I said, it's, it's, a, it's supposed to be a government of the people, by the people, for the people. So for goodness sake, be square with we the people. Um, and they haven't been on, on so many things. And that, that is what really bugs me. When you got some unelected person saying no, uh, you got Fauci telling us things that are not true, uh, that, that, that nothing makes me more mad because it's supposed to be the people that get elected make the decisions. And this is a case where the elected official, in fact, the highest elected person in the Congress, the Speaker of the House said, let's make this available. So God bless Speaker McCarthy for doing it. Good. Good. Well, God bless you with the weaponization committee that you chair for bringing in Twitter and the Twitter files and the Twitter censors and exposing the censorship industrial complex. I know that was a bombshell hearing yesterday. Did you ever think that you'd see members of Congress, Democrats, ask journalists for their sources, no. claim that people are so-called journalists that are standing before them, uh, demean and eviscerate? and behave in such a vile manner. Debbie Wasserman Schultz uh, comes to mind, uh, along with Plaskett. Yeah. I just could not believe the behavior of Democrats yesterday in your hearing. Yeah, so-called journalists, uh, journalists, award-winning journalists is what they were. New York Times best-selling uh, authors is what they were. Um, but I actually think this is one of those scary moments in American history where you had members of the United States Congress having journalists as witnesses who are under oath and asking those people to reveal their sources that that is that that is such an affront such a violation of the first amendment to to demand that and ask those kind of questions and to continue to pester these witnesses to give their sources you can't do that in america it is called freedom of the press in the first amendment with the other four rights we have the right to practice your faith the right to assemble the right to petition your government to redress your grievances and freedom of speech so you have five rights one of them specifically mentioned is freedom of the press and you had democrat members of congress saying tell us your sources that is scary. And it, to these guys, to their credit, this is one of those moments where I think if we can get this fixed, where we stop this attack by agencies on the very people they're supposed to serve, we will look back at these two journalists 
who were willing to, to step forward and tell the truth. And remember, the day before they come and testify, they learn that not only, not only do we have on, on, on the day of the hearing, Democrats ask them who their sources were. The day before the FTC, they find out the FTC is writing letters to Twitter saying, who are the journalists you're talking to? Four journalists are named personally. Two of them were the ones we had testifying yesterday, Mr. Taibbi and Mr. Schellenberger. So God bless them for having the courage to stand firm in the hearing and frankly, to come to the hearing after they knew the FTC, Biden's FTC was going after them. Yeah, doesn't it seem like a, an actual attack on journalism when they're going sure. after Tucker for doing real journalism? All Tucker's doing is exposing a different oh, perspective and the optics. And, uh, uh, you know, he's he's essentially deconstructing a narrative and showing a very complicated situation and various dimensions of it. And yeah. that's called journalism. And he's exposing sure new information to the public. I've never yeah. thought I'd see a world where journalists would scream that you'd be releasing all of the tapes. They're so upset that you're going to yeah. release all the January 6th tapes. Why? Yeah. And what, what, and what a contrast to, you know, Woodburn and Bernstein. I, I, Clay Travis made this point. What, what a contrast to them who were who, who got leaked material uh, and, and were able to present and kept their their um, their source uh, confidential as you're supposed to do. But you made a great point, Benny. Think about this. In, in, rel in basically a 24 hour period, you have Chuck Schumer writing to Fox News saying, don't yes. play the tapes. Don't let America see. You have Democrat members of Congress saying to a witness, who are your sources? And you have the Biden administration, FTC, writing to a private company saying, who are the journalists you are talking to? All that happens. We learn about all that, at least, in a 24-hour time span. That is what the left is now about. And it is, it is this is why we have this committee, because if that's not the weaponization of government, I do not know what is. <laughs> Where are our journalists? Where's yeah. the where's Jim Acosta? Yeah, Where are, they're all frauds. They're all frauds. Where are they screaming to high heavens? Where's the White House Correspondent Association? Yeah, Where, no, where's I the can't. Capitol Hill Reporting and Correspondent Association? These people should be losing their minds if they have any intellectual honesty and consistency. And they're not. They're yeah. allowing it to happen. They're cheerleading it. No, it's th th that's even worse. You're right. Not only are they not talking about it, they seem in so many ways to support it. Now, I did talk to a couple mainstream journalists yesterday as I was walking the hallway, and I do think deep down they're like, wait a minute, this is a, this is, you know, even though they, they're, they, they're probably on the left, you know, like so many in the mainstream media, I think deep down they kind of understand. And I may, actually made this point on the House floor about a year ago. And we were talking about the cancel culture mob coming after everyone. And I and I, I was on the House floor and I, I looked at my Democrat colleagues and I said, don't think they won't come after you. Right now, it's conservatives and Republicans. I said, but the mob never stops. The the the, the quest for power and, and influence and limiting speech never, never stops. And I said, they'll be coming after you. And guess what? It was about that same time where in California, in San Francisco, they said, we are no longer going to have the Diane Feinstein Elementary School because somebody found something Diane Feinstein said like 30, 40 years ago. Oh, that that doesn't fit with today's wokeness. And they said, we're going to take her name. Diane Feinstein, liberal icon and, and you know, Democrat senator. They took her name off the school. That is how the mob just keeps moving. And so if we don't stand up now and frankly, people on the left should do it like like our witnesses yesterday, Mr. Schellenberger, Mr. Taibbi, they're Democrats. But God yes. bless them. They're, they're, they believe in the First Amendment. Yes, that's right. A along with Russell Brand and along with yep. Joe Rogan and along with Elon Musk, who I think we're all Obama voters or Bernie supporters and are now finding themselves inside of our movement because it's a movement of freedom and it's a movement yep. that doesn't want government weaponization. And you're in charge of this committee. You've just requested a much larger budget for this committee and seem to be ramping up. What is the end goal? for the weaponization committee. What do you hope well, to accomplish? Great question. We, we look, the, you, we first is get the facts on the table, make sure the country knows fully what has been going on in their government that they pay for many times with their tax money being sent out to these, these not-for-profits and others who are also influencing and trying to limit uh, speech. So get all the facts on the table, then propose legislation that will fix that situation. And, and I think this is an important and, and look at the appropriations process which is, you know, all the spending and taxing bills, the way the founders set this great, great country up, the greatest nation ever. They set it up so that the spending and taxing starts in the Congress, in the legislative branch, and specifically within the House of Representatives. So use the appropriations process, the power of the purse, to also make sure that these agencies aren't being turned against the very people uh, that they're supposed to serve. Do you in an overall philosophy of government agree with Donald Trump's plan essentially to break up 
the federal government in Washington, D.C., perhaps relocate or yeah. liquidate entire agencies uh, and be rid of the sort of barnacle bureaucratic class entirely. This is, of course, something that is terrifying the left. They've written quite a bit about it. Uh, and this is uh, apparently going to be an executive order on day one. Were Donald Trump to win in 2024, would you be in favor of it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm certainly in favor of Donald Trump winning. I, I'm, I'm for President Trump. I think he's the best best president we've had, certainly in my lifetime, who did more of what he said he was going to do than any president I've ever seen. So uh, we, we want him to win. But yeah, th th you have to have that attitude because here's the problem in this town. So many people who never put their name on a ballot think they run the place. Yes. And that's not how our constitutional system works. Yes. You're supposed to go out, put your name on a ballot, go talk to the people in your respective district or your respective state, or in the case of president, of course, the whole country. Go talk to the people, we the people. And if they elect you, those are the individuals who are supposed to make the decisions. And frankly, they're supposed to do what they said they were going to do when they ran for the job and the people put them in that office. And, and President Trump did that. So I'm tired of the Fauci's who never put his name on a ballot running the stinking country. It doesn't work that way. And we've seen almost everything that guy said and did turned out to be a misleading, not accurate bunch of, you know, the things he told us just were not true. So that is something that is critically important. And President Trump is 100 percent right in trying to make sure the power returns to the people who put their name on a ballot and get elected to office. Yeah, Dr. Fauci yesterday said that he would be thrilled to come before your committee and answer questions. Will you have him? At some point, uh, I think he will be back in front of Congress. I, I assume it's going to happen in the Select Committee on the Coronavirus, which I also happen to get to be uh, get to be a part of. Uh, that is run by Congressman Winstrup. We had our first hearing there earlier this week, where Dr. Redfield really laid things out. I think in a in a in a pretty compelling way how Fauci from the get go was trying to downplay and make sure no one bought into the lab leak concept, the lab leak theory, uh, and was pushing that this thing came, as I've, as I've said before, from a bat to a pangolin to a hippopotamus to Joe Rogan, and then, you know, coronavirus goes everywhere. So uh, when we all know that it was, you know, and the reason he was so focused on that, Benny, is because Fauci knew right from the start that he had sent our tax dollars to a lab in China that wasn't up to code, that was doing gain of function research. And the virus starts in that same city where that lab's at. And he's like, oh, sugar, I got to do something. I got to I got to keep that from getting out. <clears throat> and he knew it had to come from a lab because the first email he gets on January 31st, 2020, 1032 p.m. from Dr. Christian Anderson says what? Virus looks engineered, virus inconsistent with evolutionary theory. That is a fancy way of saying it came from that lab. And he goes into overdrive to cover his backside and a bunch of things happen over the next few days. And that same doctor who said that on January 31st, on February 3rd says, you're a nut job if you think it came from a lab. Switches 180 degrees. And I think the only thing happened is Dr. Fauci got to him and said, hey dude, we gotta get our story straight because I can't have this stuff getting out. We can't have this stuff getting out. And then Christian Anderson and another doctor who said the same thing, they get a $9 million grant three months later. So specifically before your committee and also before Rand Paul over in the Senate, Dr. Fauci has, of course, absolved himself of all funding of gain of function. He said he doesn't know anything about it. It is verifiable and demonstrable that he lied. Now, there are codes in Congress. I have a code right here. 18 U.S. Code 1001. Statements, 1001, false yeah. statements to Congress. It says you can yeah. be imprisoned. It says you can be imprisoned for eight years. If you lie to Congress, it seems like there has never been a more clear cut case of some individual lying to Congress. Yeah, we Dr. can do it. Yeah, there could be a referral, but you would refer it to the to the Biden Justice Department. I don't know that. I don't know that they're going to they're going to they're going to pursue that. Uh, but you could you could definitely do that. You could, uh, you know, have have uh, one of the committees that the Senate Judiciary Committee could do a referral. I doubt they will with 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 the Democrats in charge. We could do a for, referral potentially. Uh, I, I would frankly prefer to just have Dr. Fauci come back in and take another round of questions here. But we're building the case, you know, like we had Dr. Redfield uh, uh, testify last yes. week. Uh, 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 Chairman Winstrop did. I thought he was I thought he was great, as, as were the other witnesses that were brought in. So, uh, again, laying that foundation, I do think Dr. Fauci and, and uh, the, the, the uh, CDC changed the definition of gain of function research so that Fauci has like this wiggle room. But they were juicing up this virus. No doubt about it. Juicing up this virus, making it more, more, 
you know, I, I don't know the, 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 the technical, but making it, making it juiced up and, and more, more deadly, I guess, and maybe the, the, the correct yes. word. Um, so they were doing that in this lab, and I think that's clear. So we'll, uh, we'll just have to see as we move through this, uh, this investigation. Mm -hmm. Hunter Biden, there has been, uh, speaking of people who belong in the hot seat, there's been an enormous amount of evidence that has, of course, been like a waterfall from the laptop. The 22-point email has been particularly egregious given Joe Biden's classified document scandal, and that is – Continuing to this day, nine more boxes found in his lawyer's office in Boston, right, that were taken as shuffled out of the Penn Biden Center. Do you believe that Hunter Biden had access to classified information, that he used it to profit for the Biden family? I don't know uh, that Mr. Comer on the Oversight Committee, Chairman Comer, is going to is going to pursue this this issue. Our our focus in judiciary is to the, you know, the, the degree and, and influence that the FBI may have had on, on, on how this story broke back in 2020. And we got into this yesterday in, in our uh, hearing in the, in the select committee. Um, but, you know, the, the FBI for, for a year, and this is Joel Roth, the head of uh, trust and safety at Twitter, under his sworn declaration, he says, for a year, I had meetings with ODNI, FBI, DHS. We had these weekly meetings, sometimes even more often than as it got closer to the, the election. They were telling me that to be on the lookout for a hack and leak operation, that it would happen in October of 2020 and it would involve Hunter Biden. And I'm like, I mean, they, 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 the FBI, and then it happens, you know, the FBI, so the FBI had predicted the time, the, 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 the type of operation, the method and the person. I'm like, how did they do that? How did the FBI know that there's going to be a hack and leak in October of 2020 involving Hunter Biden? And I think they knew because they had the laptop. <laughs> so they were telling them something, even though they had the laptop that they knew was all, uh, authentic. So our, our involvement, I think, is the, 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 uh, the involvement of the Justice Department in, in furthering this narrative that, uh, that they, they, they had the laptop. That, so they furthered this narrative that it's a hack and leak, and they knew that, that, that the, the laptop wasn't. So that's where we're going to, think, focus on our, uh, in our committee. So you're going to be bringing in Christopher Ray. You're going to be asking them about this because this does seem to be the largest political rigging of an election I've ever seen because you have a piece of exculpatory evidence against a prominent family member that's running for president that has crimes on it. If you're uh, if you're looking at the Marco Polo report, hundreds and hundreds of verifiable federal crimes on the single laptop. And they did everything they could, not only to hide it from the American people, but to call it fake when they knew yeah. it was real. Yeah, not only not only to hide it from the American people, but but to to it seems prime and prep the American people that um, if in fact it came out, it wasn't true. I mean, they, they, they so yes. that's that's the most frightening part. And it's like, you had it for a year. You had it in December of 2019. So for the next 10 months, you're doing this prime and prep operation um, that that I, I think, as, as you said, Benny, obviously had an impact on the election. Yeah. What, what legislation will we see? You know, in, in sort of conclusion here, what what legislation can we see? Because the hearings are great and the yeah. sound bites are great and we love them and we'll play them on the show and we no, love understand. tweeting them out. But the, the flame throwing is great. How do we prevent this from happening in the future? Yeah, I think you got to use the appropriation process uh, primarily. And then legislatively, I mean, maybe there's certain certain uh, certain bills that need to happen. Like one 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 just I think little example is it, when the FBI is doing interviews. I mean, may, maybe that interview should be should be an audio tape of that interview. I mean, if you had an audio tape, I don't know that they could they could they could press charges against Michael Flynn like they did in the whole Trump Russia investigation. Uh, maybe you maybe you, you look at why do. Why do people keep their security clearance after they leave government? My bet is those 51 who signed that now famous letter that said, you know, all the earmarks of a Russian information operation, the Hunter Biden story. Maybe um, maybe they shouldn't keep their security clearance. Maybe there's a good reason for it. Maybe there isn't. I, I, that's something I think we should look into. So a host mm -hmm. of things I think we need to examine. Uh, final question, your message to Elon Musk. You've now held multiple hearings about Twitter. What is yeah. your message to Elon? God bless him. God bless Elon Musk for standing up for the First Amendment um, and, and recognizing how important that is to the greatest country ever, uh, protecting those, those, those freedoms. I mean, I think that what a service he's done for the country. Yeah, truly. I, 
I mean, truly, I, I think possibly the uh, the greatest act of public service uh, in my lifetime is yep. opening up free speech once more. And now you've seen the repercussion effects across social media. It's changed. Yep. It's changed everything. We do this every single day. This is our career. And we, we've seen we've seen the uh, mob uh, that was at the gate, the orcs at the gate, like retreat because of Twitter. It's been wild. So, yep. yes, a, a national treasure. As are you, sir. Thank you no, so much, you are. Congressman, you for being on our program. Jim Thanks Jordan. Thanks for your great everyone. work. Take care. Who, baby, Jim Jordan coming in hot saying that federal agents and federal prosecutors that lied and that withheld evidence need to be disbarred and maybe charged. He said that there were confidential human sources inside of January 6th that the federal government was using. Jim Jordan is the repository of the uh, FBI whistleblowers. They all go to Jim Jordan. He apparently has over a dozen FBI whistleblowers, and he says he has evidence of this. Big stuff from Jim Jordan, along with, of course, the Twitter files and all of the rest. Gosh, we love doing this. We love you. We thank you. Uh, it is you that allow us to gain this momentum, the Benny Battalion, uh, Salty Army, all of the people watching. We thank you because of you, we are able to draw big names like Jim Jordan, James Comer, Julie Kelly, everyone who's been on the show this week, Mike Davis, Cash Patel, all the rest. We have some other big names coming up. I'm sure you can guess. And we're going to be going live with some of the biggest names and the biggest names in our movement. We're going to be asking them your questions. We thank you. All we request is that you subscribe. All we ask for is that you subscribe. Uh, we know that Joe Biden's economy sucks. <laughs> and so we're just saying, help us out by subscribing and watching. We promise to bring you excellent. S excellence and speaking of sucking, Joe Biden does indeed suck. Joe Biden admits that Trump might be the future president. <laughs> Even Joe Biden admits it. Democrat crowd boos as Biden teases 2024 rematch and attacks MAGA Republicans in speech on $6.8 trillion budget. Biden claims MAGA Republicans are calling for a friend of police departments. Got it? You, you remember, you're the ones who want to defund the police departments. Take it away. MAGA Republicans are calling for defunding the police department. Okay, cool. Uh, that's great. Got my, got my earpiece stuck back here. Whatever. You know what? Let it fly. It's Friday. It's also time to let it fly. Joe Biden in our new segment called Joe Biden versus Teleprompter. Joe Biden versus Teleprompter saying that Donald Trump is probably going to be the future president. Watch. Guess what? You may remember I was running for office at the time, but you all may remember it, that the, I had a big fight with uh, the former president uh, and maybe future president. Bless me, father. Anyway, no. Oh, OK. G give me a bl give me a bless me, father, from the guy who supports abortion up to the point of birth and then after birth, actually. Remember, Democrats are pro post birth abortion. Yeah. He's so Catholic. He's so Joe Biden's so Christian that he went to multiple church services. Remember, he went to the, the Catholic church and then the black church later on. Definitely the guy who raised Hunter Biden. Big church goer. Also, so Christian is Joe Biden that uh, the pope, when he died, Pope Ratzinger, requested that Joe Biden not come to his funeral. That was one of his dying wishes. So maybe you should do a little soul searching. In fact, soul searching is what we do on this show. We search for truth and we wish to deliver you truth. And sometimes we get things wrong. We always say it, right? For instance, Leader McCarthy. I was hard in the paint against Leader McCarthy. I was hard in the paint against Speaker McCarthy. And uh, man, McCarthy has blown the doors off. And now he's going to release all the footage for you and me to go through. So we very much look forward to going through that footage with you, along with the entire rest of the internet. We know that we'll find some treasures there. We'll always admit when we're wrong. We'll always speak truth to you. And to ensure that, we anchor our show in a single thing, a Bible verse. We always want to look to the actual truth every single show to keep us grounded. This verse of the day comes from Hebrews. It's a great verse to start your weekend off with. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done 
the will of God, ye might receive the promise. Ye, not yea, as in Kanye, but ye. The old King James version there. When you are patient and you focus on God, you will receive what God has promised to you. What has God promised to you? Think about that this weekend. Has God promised you prosperity? A happy, peaceful life? Has he promised to keep you and to protect you? Yes, 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 and yes. He has promised you these things. He's going to take care of you. Take a deep breath. Feel the energy around you. Understand good energy versus bad. And know that we are in a battle of good and evil. And it's a spiritual battle. So stay grounded. Stay firmly grounded in things like God, family, country. That's what we focus our lives on, on this program, every single day. And we show up for you so that we can have this movement together. And together, we're going to save this place. We're going to focus on God. We're going to receive what he has promised us. And it's pretty great. The best part about it, well, we already know that we are victorious. You are victorious today. You are already victorious, ladies and gentlemen. God's in control, not these clowns. They always think they're in control. They're not. They're not. And we have the victory. Go into this weekend victorious with us. God bless you. My name is Benny Johnson, and this is The Benny Show. Thank <laughs> you.